Right, guys, um, I think without any further ado, we'll get started. So we early on acknowledged that uh, lockdown the second for us in the UK was going to be um, oh, hopefully short. And I think quite a few of us thought, oh, that's all right. It's only a month. We did what, four before? Um, but we're not coming at it fresh anymore, guys. And um, there's a whole lot of craziness going on inside all of our heads, whether we like to acknowledge it or not, with our subconscious and our conscious and, and taking on all new patterns and new ways of doing everything and all these things that we've learned through our lives. Um, and I think that goes a long way to explaining why, speaking person anyway, I found it more challenging the second time round. Um, we're not coming at it with a, with a full tank of gas, so to speak. Um, and that's why the people that we've looked to get on um, to speak to us on webinars and things, there's been more of a push towards the mental health side of things. Um, and that's why we've got the lovely Belinda here. Um, I'm super, super chuffed that, um, that she's agreed to come on and, and talk to you guys. Um, uh, yeah, I met Belinda at the start of the year before this all kicked off, didn't I? <laughs> How long ago does that seem now? Um, that was three and a half years ago in... <laughs> yes, so according to my grey hairs. <laughs> um, yeah, Belinda honestly could, could probably talk to us all for five hours about the most amazing things, um, but we'll try and keep it to, uh, to eight o'clock so we can get you, um, well, those of you who are buggering off to do yoga as well, on for that. But um, yeah, I won't say too much more, but this is an incredibly inspiring lady. I'm very lucky to have met her and I'm really excited to have her come and speak to you all. So make sure you listen up, take notes and absorb. <laughs> so firstly, how is everybody? Hands up, how are we feeling? Are we, we're okay, hands up? We're kind of okay, half hands down? I'm going to try and see everybody on the screen if I can. So I'm just going to do a quick full view if I can. So I can almost see as many people as possible. So I've got a few people that are kind of like this also as well. <laughs> oh no, I, 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 I see that we're doing like a Vogue thing. Is it like a YMCA to start with? <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, you, you didn't tell me that we have the whole YMCA dancing on here. <laughs> <laughs> You're lucky they're not oh, wearing the outfit. Are you? We've not let any more crazy Aussies onto this call, have we? <laughs> we have got a few. I'm not sure there's any of them on the call, actually. <laughs> so, look, I just want to say a huge, huge thank you for having me, everybody, as well. And look, we're all pretty zoomed out. Um, somebody asked me, asked me for a meeting the other day, and I said, if it's Zoom, the answer is no. Um, if it's any other form, carry a pigeon catch up via WhatsApp messenger, anything. I said, but do not make me sit on Zoom. So look, I am super conscious that, you know, we are on Zoom and you've most probably sat in front of a screen 477,000 times. And it's to the point where I'm sure, oh, hi. <laughs> Thanks, Ian. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm sure it's to the point where you think, oh gosh, not another one. So I'm going to try and vary it a little bit. So I know I can see most people on, on, on screen as well. And I am going to try and flick through so I can also, um, you know, actually mention everybody's name apart from if you've got a random set of letters and numbers. Um, and I think, no, everybody's got a name on there. <laughs> so I asked you the question at the beginning, put your hand up on how you're feeling. And, and look, um, the space that we're in, um, from the businesses that I operate, that's what we're hearing an awful lot. It's that kind of okay, kind of not okay. And it's a bit like, and I'm hoping that I can actually share my screen. I wanted to, um, I'm going to ask Ian if you wouldn't mind helping me to disable the screen sharing. I promise you I'm not going to sh share any rude images. <laughs> we all have those Zoom calls, don't we? Which is why we've got all of these extra securities on there. Sure. I so just asked. You can trust me. I've closed all the other screens down just in case. <laughs> I'll just ask Catherine to do that because she's actually her, she's hosting the call because she took the work out before this. No problem at all. Whoever can, if you can share the screen. No worries. Yeah, we will do. That'd be great. And then I can share. So one of the things that we, we often talk about, and I don't know, who knows what I do? Does anybody on the call actually know what I do and why I'm here? didn't read my bio. Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So I, what I am is I'm just some random. So Ian just thought, just get some, no. He's actually brought me on for a reason. So our company um, deals with corporate wellness, corporate health. Um, and we do a lot around peak performance and peak performance coaching as well. So the reason why I'm here is, you know, is to talk about some of the lessons from the mountain and also about that whole messaging around coping strategies, talking about some habits as well. But I'm hopefully, by sharing a few of the stories, I'm hoping that it will actually resonate a little bit with you. And, and obviously then I'll open it up to Q&As as well. And I've got some stuff that I'd love to share with you. And I, Ian, I'm happy to, to share this across with, um, with, with you or Sally, you know, you can share it on. So rather than it just being a talk fest, I also want to stop share some lessons from some of the trips and some of the adventures that I've been on. And then, you know, at the end, I've got a, some really, really interesting info about managing that kind of mental wellness. So hands up, who's enjoying lockdown? I'm going to flick all the way across just to make sure that I'm including everybody a little bit. Kind of. And a thumbs up. The majority of people won't be, and I know we're in partial lockdown here. I'm currently not even allowed in my own home country, Australia. So um, I get it. So first of all, I want to start off by saying I absolutely get it. For those that are enjoying it, then that's absolutely fantastic. And um, you know, please share why and how you're enjoying it at the tail end of the conversation. But I wanted to share a couple of thoughts um, and ideas with you as well. And thank you whoever just shared, allowed me to, um, to share the screen. That is awesome. Thank you. Just give me one second. Oh, the joys of technology. Doesn't like my, um, doesn't like my PowerPoint. Strange. That's okay, I can, I'll, I'll try and do it again. So I wanted to give you a bit of a, an overview on some of the lessons that, that have gone on and some of the, the challenges and what we're using with, with our clients to help to bring them through some, not just lockdowns, but obviously some of the most challenging things. So I wanted to just share, and I will have to, um, I will have to get this PowerPoint up because I just want to share this particular image with you, which I think would be absolutely fantastic. I've only been using Zoom for about, 27 years or so, I don't know why it's not working. I actually used Zoom before it was a thing, like before it was a thing. <laughs> so before even people started talking about the fact that Zoom was a thing, I was, um, I was actually using it. Okay, so let's see if I can get this up. I don't know if I can get it up for some reason. PowerPoint anyway. You've got the option to share the, the, the screen, Belinda. Yeah, it just won't allow me to, um, to share it for some reason, which is very unusual. It's never, that's never happened before. Has anybody sat on, um, on meetings before and it, it almost seems like a, 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 a modern day seance where is anybody there? Can anybody hear me? <laughs> yeah. Are you there? There's been so many of those moments recently as well. Here we go. I'm so sorry about the, um, the, the tech challenges. I just wanted to share something, uh, something with you. So can everybody see that particular slide there? I'm just going to show it in, um, I'm just going to show it in this view for, for now. So quick show of hands. Anybody felt a little bit like that for 2020? A little bit like a roller coaster, holding on, holding on for the challenges, holding on for the downs, and then also holding on for the highs. And one of the things that I, you know, I wanted to, to share with you is that one of the things that we're really hearing an awful lot of is this. It's what do I, what do I do for the highs and also for the lows as well. So one of the things I want to share with you is a couple of a couple of stories. So when we, when we talk about how to keep on track and how to keep on focus, 
Everybody heard of Simon Sinek and the why? Yep, you've got it, Katie, I can see you. And there's somebody waiting to come in, but I won't let them in just in case it's somebody that shouldn't be coming in. Thanks, Dave, I saw that. <laughs> so Simon Sinek talks about, you know, finding your why. And one of the things that I think throughout a lot of the, the challenges that have gone on is, is finding out what is your why. And if, if nothing else from some of these, um, you know, some of these things that are going on currently is actually what is your why. So has anybody got a glass of wine with them or a beer or a coffee or you've got one with you? Yeah. <laughs> now mine's a wonder one cup, so you will never know what's in this cup. I can I could say it's water and it could be anything. So the reason why I, I get you to hold your glass up or your cup up is that the reality is we can't pour from an empty cup or an empty glass. And this is where people get the bottle out now with the straw. And you know, the reality is that we can't pour from an empty cup. And one of the things that I think that, um, that I wanna share with you as well is the reality is if we've got something stronger to drive us, when all of these things are happening, it's easier. And I just wanna share very, very quickly my why and what's got me through some of the challenges also in the time. So I don't know who the little girl is at the front. <laughs> Terrible haircut, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> but <laughs> that beautiful, amazingly gorgeous lady that you see behind her is my mum. Uh, my mum is, uh, is called Jackie. She is the happiest person, and I believe the happiest person in the world. And unfortunately, she's no longer here. It helps me to think she's a, an angel in heaven. I'm not religious in any way, shape or form, but it's whatever helps you and drives you to get through these things. So this beautiful, amazing lady, a similar age to myself um, that I am now, she had um, breast cancer. So one of the things that has come through in particularly in 2020 is that she's the reason why I set my company up. She's the reason why I do the majority of what I do. So you're most probably thinking now, well, how does that relate to mental health and wellness and getting through these challenges? I don't want to, the topic of this conversation is in no way meant to be sad, but I'm trying to highlight, I think, nothing else that could ever happen to me in life could be as bad as losing my mom to breast cancer while she was in her mid forties, nothing. There is nothing else that anybody ever in the world could ever throw at me. She's my why. When things don't go right, when we talk about that roller coaster, I always go back to that why. I'll just flick to this picture here and I'll explain a little bit more about this later. But you can see she comes with me on every single mountain that I climb all around the world. Now, your why doesn't have to be a person. It doesn't have to be a, a huge audacious goal, but you have to, your why has to be strong enough so that it drives you each and every day. So I'm often asked, you know, what are the things that motivate me and, and, and Ian? That was one of the questions that you asked me, wasn't it? Can we, can you share that with the group when we were talking about it? When I asked you... You're asking me to, um, to come on and give a bit of a talk. You're asking me, I said, you know, what are the topics and those types of things? So would you mind just sharing with the group? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so we were talking about, the, the, you mean the reasons why the guys sort of said, oh, um, what, what are we seeing and what are we hearing from, from the clients as, to, as yeah. to what they're struggling with? Yeah, so um, one of the big ones, just trying to bring it up. Yeah, main thing was, the recurring theme was uncertainty. Um, and feeling a lack of control over things that we normally feel like we can control um and the just the open-endedness of the whole thing this is obviously uncharted territory that was a huge factor um another thing was sort of separating work from home the two are bleeding into each other i think a lot of folks on the call are working more hours than they were before maybe and obviously you're doing it all in the same space yeah. um <laughs> doom scrolling on social media and how much that affects us and maybe we all like to pretend that that's no, fine my feed's really positive but it probably isn't right now um and 
guilt around taking time out and um and particularly that was for parents i think we saw that one so yeah there's quite a few things floating around um yeah. quite you know not uh, that unusual challenges but i think more amplified by the situation yeah and i think that's why i wanted to draw this into the conversation because i want this conversation you know i'm going to go through a little bit about the um about the seven summits and some of the things that i've done but i also want to make it real i want this to be a conversation where we can you know we can have that open dialogue and say okay so what is your why then so if anybody i know some people have got a wine in their hand and not necessarily a paper and pen but it, you know if you've got if you've got a paper and pen handy if you haven't already got that why and i call it your everest like what is your everest my everest is everest um, but what's your everest and it could be anything i work with clients where their everest is getting out of bed in the morning and i've worked with clients that their everest is making a billion dollars some of them it's about having a family some is about getting fit keeping well you know the absence we talk about happiness is it's often described depending on which research but it's often described as the absence of, of ill health or ill um, ill being for example but the reality is having something to drive you through this and this is the time when you can set those crazy goals you know i i, I didn't necessarily have um, lockdown to set the crazy goals that i'm doing but i did have a why and that beautiful amazing um person like you see there is is one of my whys i have you know i have to and she's one of them and when anything hits hard like we've just gone into partial lockdown here as well um you know being we've been denied access to healthcare and different things and you think that i'm not right i always go back to my why and sail the ship around an iceberg so i wanted to share with you the second the second thing that drives me and one of the things that I've just put up a picture here, so I will warn you, you will see a picture of um, the feet don't look very pretty. So I just want to warn you before it comes up. So this, the reason why I put this picture up here is, does anybody know what that picture is on the right hand side? Not the feet, the picture. I can see you looking. I can see quite a few of you leaning in as well to see what it is. Katie, I can see you're all kind of looking. <laughs> Hema, what are you thinking? Any thoughts? Something you wear when you've got a club foot. Oh my gosh, who said that? That was uh, Anne. Pardon? Was that Anne or Katie? Sorry, I didn't hear the name. Well, Anne, I, I said something. Anne, hi, Anne. Hi, thank you. Uh, That's absolutely uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. On the on the left, um, the um, the legs. I, I've got um, a cousin who was a thalidomide victim, and when he was born, his uh, feet were very much like that. Well, the reason, and thank you for sharing, and I really appreciate it. What you see there is what I was born with. So I was born with bilateral telopes feet and that caliper is my caliper. The brown leather most probably gives it away that it was in the 1970s, very, very late 1970s though when I had that caliper, so late, possibly 80s. But what you see there was two steel bars. Now, there's a reason why I'm sharing this. This is not about victim. This is not about looking back. This is about looking at what drives you so i always talk about when i'm on top of a mountain for example when i'm crawling because i often have to crawl to the top of them because it's exhausting when i get to the top the thing that has driven me is that that disability the fact that i did lose my mom at a young age and having that disability has driven me so incredibly hard to set goals like climbing the seven summits crossing the North and South Pole as soon once I finish that, heading to Everest in 2022. I am no different than anybody else sat on this call. Kathy, I'm no different than yourself. Anna, I'm no different than yourself. Katie, Sal, all of the people sat on the call, I'm absolutely no different. 
Um, yes, you know, the, the, the feet may have been turned under and all of, um, you know, had to wear a caliper. But there's some lessons from all of this. One of the lessons that being in calipers taught me is that you find a way around. I don't want to, you know, the the thing around this is I had to learn to shuffle around on my backside. Now that's why I say my backside is a little bit bigger than it should be. That's my excuse. That's all mm -hmm. I'm saying. <laughs> you find your way around it. Whatever's putting your way, you find your way around it. I was the calip wasn't told I couldn't walk. I found a way to shuffle. I found a way to wear the back of those boots down to the point where um, I got in trouble because they were so expensive, like hundreds and hundreds of dollars. For I know they don't look like it, but they were. So you find your way around it. You know, that's one thing that I look at, you know, I look at some of the, the, the images and pictures around the office, and that's one of the things that comes out for me is find a way around it. So, you know, the doctors are not always right. I was told I would never walk properly again. You know, we all have our own Everest, but it's about finding your Everest and what that is. So some of the lessons, and I, and I didn't, I didn't um, cover off on the, the top one with my mom, you know, some of the lessons of losing my mom was, we call it, has anybody done anything around Jack Campfield's work? Events, so you might have seen the E plus R equals O. Has anybody ever seen that? We we talk about it a lot. Um, yeah, hopefully these guys are listening when I talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's you know that's one of the things that you know I I go through all the lessons you know what that actually taught me you know and I'm looking at some of the the images around the office you know losing mom was about life is precious you know spread the happiness where you can and that actual event plus your response equals the outcome. When I lost my mum, my response could have been very different than it was, and it nearly was. But instead I turned it around and created a company, a global organisation that's creating the happiest workplaces on the planet. So it's about the event, it's about your response, and it equals the outcome. The outcome of the disability. So does anybody know what this is in front? This is summit one, summit two, and summit three. Any idea what they are? Feel free to unmute yourself as well and chat. Dave, you might have a might have an idea. Maybe Denny. Is it the um, seven highest peaks across all the continents? Ooh, I can't see everybody, so I can't see who said that. That was Perry. <laughs> Awesome, 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 awesome. So yes, it is, uh, bonus prize. You absolutely guessed right. It's the seven highest summits on each continent. So the top one is Kosciuszko in Australia. And um, summit two is Kilimanjaro, that is obviously in Africa. The one that you see on the right, summit three, is Mount Elbrus in a very beautiful Russia because it actually is incredibly steep in the Caucasus Mountains. Next one is Aconcagua, then Everest, then Denali, then the North and South Pole. So why did I share that with you? I shared that with you because that's one of the lessons of being knocked down, literally, physically knocked down, being told I would never walk again. I'm now about to stand on the highest mountains on each continent. And again, that could have been very different. I could have been in calipers that were pretty much the whole of my life. Uh, but it was because of my mum that I'm able to, to walk again now. So the reason I share that with you is that lesson of whatever knocks you down can never be as challenging as some of the things that many of you have already faced. You know, Owen, I'm sure you face you know, some challenges. Liz, I'm sure you have. Hema, we've all got our own stories. We've all got our own background. But what if you could switch that so you're actual event, your response, and the outcome is so incredibly different. I wouldn't even be sat here now if it wasn't for my mum's response, which was to get me in surgery, even though she was told not to do it, because it was experimental. So imagine if that response was different. What's the movie? Help me out. Um, what is it? The Sliding Doors. Is it called Sliding Doors? Somebody help me. Yes. Yeah. It is Sliding Doors. Yeah, okay. So, 
I'm not really in the mood. So, it's just going to be here. It's such and such a movie. So, the sliding doors theory you know, that couldn't be incredibly different. So, why have I shared that with you again? It's that's what life is about. Life is about getting knocked down. You know, when they say keep getting back up again. That picture on the right hand side there, some at three or seven. What do you think it looks like? It's been an easy trip up there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was hell. It was a living hell. I know there's a really big smile on there, but can I tell you, I had altitude sickness. Have we got any doctors? Any doctors on the call? Doctors or medical professionals, anybody? No? No. The, and I asked that question before I'd even been at altitude. At that point, my brain had swollen, so it was starting to crush against my skull. I could barely see. And <laughs> I still don't know to this day how I had that smile on my face. It's also negative 15 for some bizarre reason when you um, start to get um, you know, delirious and all those things, you start to take your layers off. Well, I took my layers off thinking I was hot. I wasn't, it was negative 15, and I was suffering incredibly badly with altitude sickness. Just after that photograph was taken, by the way, so you know, we often say the smile can hide a million things. I put that photograph away back into my red jacket that you see. And from there, I walked down the, the hill, which is not too steep because it then starts to bank around. By the time I got to the bottom, I was on my knees taking additional tablets because the swelling in my brain was so much that I could actually barely see. Um, nobody knows that. Yes, I'm sharing it here. And, you know, a couple of family and friends know, but people don't know that because we often have those internal battles that people don't need to know about. And again, why am I sharing it? I'm sharing it because regardless of what happens, we still carry on. You still look at that, you know, what drives you, you know, what you, you know, what you inspire you. So that's summit three. The next one is uh, summit four of Icon Capital. And then we, we head then down into um, Everest, or up into Everest, I should say, then Denali and the Northern South Pole. So please do reach out if anybody, if any of you are adventurous, um, if any of you are, you know, planning on doing any of these trips. Please do reach out. You know, you've got my details from from here, and I'll reach out on social media. You know, I'd love to share. You know, I'd love to share ideas and thoughts and stories as well with you. So, question for you: What is that? A yak. Boom. <laughs> it certainly is. <laughs> It's a yeah. So I wanted to share a funny story. Well, I say funny, it wasn't funny at the time, but I wanted to share this, this incredibly funny story with you because it reminds me so much of what we're currently going through at the moment. <laughs> Vicky's put luggage delivery. <laughs> Chat, Vicky's just put luggage delivery. Um, technically, yes, well done, Vicky, also luggage delivery. Also, can I just tell you, these yaks are about, it depends on which type, but they're about 250 to 260 kilograms. And I wanted to share a very, very quick and very funny story with you. Um, and then I just want to show some things around coping strategies. So, I want you to picture this scene for me. You're on the side of Everest. So, just close your eyes for me for just a second, that's all. I just want to set the scene. So, you're on the side of the mountain on Everest. It's about five degrees, four to five degrees, not particularly cold, but around you is pretty much the mountain up to your right hand side and down to the left hand side is a sheer drop. Now, when I say a sheer drop, I mean a drop off the edge of the mountain to sudden death. So, pretty cool, but not cold. Now, open your eyes for me. Okay, so you're right there with me at the moment. And you hear this. That was me at the side of the mountain. The noise that you heard was a yak. 
I was on the side of a mountain with Dr. Sue. Dr. Sue is a friend of mine, and I said it's her love and dear when I said Dr. Sue. We were chatting away, we were walking up the mountain, getting excited about the fact that we could see the mountain ahead of us. Chattering away as you do, talking about life, talking about mountains, keeping in mind that you're always taught mountainside. Now, what I mean by mountainside is that if you've got a bloody big drop on one side and you've got the mountain on the other, you keep to the mountainside. I know this. If I close my eyes and go to sleep, I could tell you in my sleep the little mountainside, mountainside, mountainside. So when we heard the gentle, we thought, oh, hark, I hear such a beautiful yak bell. Oh, more beautiful yak bells. And then we heard more and more and more beautiful yak bells until the yak bell noise became so ferocious that we looked up. As we looked up, there was 16, a herd of 16 yaks herding towards us down the hill. We've got stones going up, we've got dirt blowing up, and we're stood there watching and facing them, they're coming towards us. We had the yak herder at the back of us yelling in Nepalese. I pray that he was yelling, please stop. Or he was yelling, see the Aussie ladies run them over. It was one of the two. And I'm edging my bets with he was saying, please stop. He was holding on to the tail of the last yak. And when I say holding on, holding on, being pulled down the mountain. At this point, I looked over at Sue. I can't tell you what I said. I think this is being recorded. But it was something along the lines of, oh, darn, we may just die at this particular moment. Oh, something to those effects. Something to those words anyway, those to those effects. At that point, the yaks were already upon us. They were already hurting towards us. Yakir had lost control of them. We were no longer on the side of the mountain. We were now looking at the drop, the sheer drop down below us. So I turned to Dr. Sue. I said a few choice words, possibly a prayer. I don't know what we really said. She held on. You can see those horns there on that picture. She was holding on to the horns. The horns were at her side of her waist on her left and on her right. She was holding them. At that point, she got pushed off the side. All I know is that her and I were pushed outside the mountain. I don't really remember much about it other than I saw and tried to hold on to her behind her. She was holding on to the horns. From there, I don't remember anything other than throwing out my left arm and grabbing something. I didn't know what it was. I grabbed hold of, thankfully, a bush, a tree, a shrub. She landed on me twisted and landed on me. At this point now, this is where flexibility comes in. So Greenwich training team, when you talked about flexibility, this is why it matters. My leg was vertical up, digging into the side of the mountain. Dr. Sue was on my right hip and I was holding on for dear life. There was a moment where I stopped breathing. I literally stopped breathing. And I looked down and there was nothing. Nothing but death. Still holding on, we had absolutely no idea how we were going to get back up again. By this point, the yaks had all gone past, thank goodness. The yak herd had seen that we'd fallen off by this point and he went to help us. Dr. Sue couldn't get up because of the angle that she was in, he couldn't get to her. She had to take the pack off in mid hand, throw the pack off. She then got herself up and then they had to pull me up. Now, what I didn't realize about flexibility in the human body during stress and during times is I learned that I could put my nose to my knee and still get myself up a mountain. So if ever you're told that flexibility isn't worth it, if it is, you never know when you're gonna be pushed off the mountain by a set of yaks. So we were pulled up, we dusted ourselves off, we relatively unbruised, relatively unmarked, just covered in a little bit of dirt and obviously um, shot. I've shared the story a couple of times and, uh, and only a couple of times recently, this happened a few years ago, and I share it for a reason. A, because it's quite hilarious that I nearly died on the side of um, a mountain and it would have been one of those really Aussie dies from the attack. And, you know, I think it would have been a really shocking headline, one that I wouldn't, as a mountaineer, wouldn't have been very happy with. 
But I also share it for a reason that life throws yaps. It throws stuff at you. It throws the things that I went through as a child. But it throws losing mom. It throws yaps at us. What we're going through now is, is like 16 or 20 or 30 yaps. And yes, it can keep pushing us down. Yes, it can push us off the mountain. And yes, we could face very different ways of which we, we respond to it. But let's go back to that event again versus your actual response equals the outcome. When I held on for dear life to that shrub and I looked down, these are the exact same words. And as whoever is my witness, whoever they is going to die. And I realized from that moment on that you have a choice in life. You have a choice when, and when I say live and die, I don't mean literal live and die. No. What I mean by that is we have a choice. You know, we have a choice to use that why to drive us. You know, I use that, that why of losing my mom, the happiest person on the planet, now to drive the work that we do. You know, I've used the disability, I've used the yaks to be able to say that if a yak can't get me, then I'm darn sure, you know, a couple of other things that are being mm -hmm. thrown out there. So I want to take a pause there. It's a lot of talking. I know I don't want to do a talk fest. There's nothing worse than having to sit and listen to someone do the whole talk fest. So knowing the stories and the, the craziness of it all. So thinking about what we've just spoken about there with the yak. And thinking about the, the response of the planet. We've all had those situations where we've had the yaks, but I want to flip it around as well now. And you don't have to share what story it is, by the way, if it's personal. But can somebody on the call share with us a situation where, you know, it may have been a set of yaks or it may have been something challenging? And what you did to flip that switch from, you know, it crushing you or it you know, really destroying you or your business or whatever it was, how did you flip the switch? You know, what were those words that you said to yourself? Like I said on the side of the mountain where I said, Belinda, you're not dying today. It wasn't my time. I didn't want to come off that side of that mountain. So what are the things, what have you flipped? So Liz or Owen or Hiba, you know, what, what have you done? How have you flipped that switch? You know, how have you... How do you come back and say, actually, I'm going to flip my response to this and it's going to be a better outcome? Feel free to unmute yourself. <gasps> so quiet. So quiet. <laughs> Never been so quiet. <laughs> It's quite hard to think of uh, something to, that I've overcome that quite comes near that story. We've <laughs> um, all got our own Everest, Dave. It doesn't matter to me. You know, getting out of bed for some people is a phenomenal achievement. So, you know, it, I don't, you know, for me, it doesn't matter whether it's an Everest or not. I'm just really keen to hear your story. For myself, I think the nearest thing that comes to mind is, a, is actually a, um, a job change I went through a couple of years back. Um, so literally I've been working at the same company straight out of uni and I've been working there for the best part of a decade and it was one of those places where I was so attached to it, I treated it like my family and I was really, really uh, kind of got a bit probably wrapped up in the hype, you know, was considered a, a high performer and you know, I, I attached a lot of importance to that and probably a large part of my ego came from that and I had a, I had a couple of crap years actually Toward, towards the end where maybe I, there was one year where actually I didn't do a great job. I turned it around then in a year, to, I did a better job. Um, and then I got stabbed in the back really badly by um, one of the really senior partners who I considered quite a good friend. And again, right up until that point, I, I felt like I'd just been taking this beating and I'd been staying and just doing, I was like, okay, well, it's clearly it's still my fault. I need to just keep I don't know, work harder and be better or something. And it was only actually when I just started talking to a few people and it was, a, it was actually a mate from one of the orchestras that I play in that, was, that just said, I, you know, it doesn't need to be like that. Just go talk to some other people that do a similar job to you and see if you think it might be any different. 
Um, and that, that was a really nice experience actually, because I, I hadn't even considered the fact that I could be worth offering a job anywhere else. I just assumed that was the only place I could work. Um, so actually I got another job out of that and felt quite emotional about leaving the place I was really, really attached to. But the new place is working out well. I also now have learned a lot from that, that it, it doesn't pay to necessarily be quite so emotionally attached to a company. But I'm a lot happier. So I don't know, it, it certainly isn't anything like that story. But I definitely felt it was a moment when I had to turn something around and it felt like a big deal to me at the time. Yeah. And it is a big deal because so much of our lives are actually attached, our identity, whether we like it or not, Dave, you know, I absolutely agree. And thank you so much for sharing that as well, because it is vital. You know, we, we do attach ourselves as, a, as titles, you know, as, as mothers or fathers or aunts or uncles, brothers, sisters, wives, husbands, whatever title. And also, you know, very connected to the business. I know I live and breathe, um, you know, clarity. And it's, and it's so much a part of me that absolutely when something like that happens, you go through the same cycle as you do with the grief cycle. So whether you're, you know, whether you go through that same cycle from a work perspective, or whether you go through what we're going through right now with the, um, the lockdowns, it's the same cycle. You know, you have to go through that same cycle of acceptance. Um, and something that you said as well, which really resonated with it, is about that worthiness also as well, is knowing your worth. If you've got something strong enough, that why, we go right back to the beginning where if something, if your why is strong enough, then you are going to change jobs. You know, you are going to have a better outcome. You know, when E equals, um, you know, the, the, the equation that we were talking about is that event can be anything. So, you know, I think it's important, you know, to keep sharing those experiences as well, because imagine if I hadn't gone on, imagine if I hadn't gone on to that side of that bush, things could have been very, very different. And I think that's what comes out from all of this as well. I just wanted to share this last um, slide here. So we, we because we, we do a lot around happiness, um, we, you know, we travel around the, the globe talking about happiness and my current research. And then I found this, I just wanted to, I found this actually for the group. So I wanted to, I wanted to pop this into a slide so you can see. So I just want to be very, very clear that I, this is not my graphic. Um, I'm very, very um, honest and open. So um, unfortunately, I couldn't get to the source of who, uh, who put this together. So going through what we're going through, I just wanted to put some, um, you know, I suppose some of the, the science behind it as well. So we're often talking about, as a company, how can we create happiness? Now, as we all know, we can't create happiness. We can create environments that create happiness. We have an element of happiness which is within our DNA. So a quick show of hands. Would anybody say that they come from a happy family? Like, did you have, you know, bubbling happy parents jumping up and down all the time? Did anybody actually come from a super happy family? Feel free to click your hand up, Vicky or Fiona, Jenny, Jake, if I know you haven't got your cameras on, but feel free to raise your hand if you, if you have. Anybody have a super happy jumping around family? No. Yeah, it's, and I find that an interesting, Liz, I, I, I saw you response to that because it was the same I did with my mom, but not necessarily with my dad. So, you know, why would I move into happiness? So whilst we talk about some of this is genetic, it's, it's only a small percentage. The environment that we create around us, and this is why I was really quick to say yes, when Ian did ask me, because I do believe hugely in communities. What you have created um, at Greenwich Town and, um, and Ian, and obviously the, the wider team as well, is you've created that environment that fosters happiness, that fosters that environment where, you know, once the, once the downsides happen to life, you've got that community. So the reason why I shared this is I often get asked for happiness hacks. You know, how can I be happy? And I wish I could answer that question because um, I wouldn't need to be my doctor. I could just go around the world and make millions of dollars just giving people um, happiness hacks. I don't know how I would do that. It might be in a box or something. 
maybe it could be a bag of happiness i don't know if anybody's got any ideas of how we could package happiness up please don't say happy pills because that's a whole other story that got lost in translation when i went and lived in dubai don't talk about happiness pills when you're in a middle eastern country could have got me in a lot of trouble i may not have been here ian you may have been bailing me out so happiness hacks so i want to share this before we finish and then open to a quick q a as well so we talked about so far we talked about what are the things the lessons from the mountains the lessons from some of the challenges the lessons from falling down and getting back up again and all of, through all of this the main thing for me is happiness it's always coming back to that why what creates happiness so i found this beautiful diagram that i wanted to share with um, the Greenwich teams. you've got a couple of happiness chemicals if you want to call them chemicals you've got hormones and chemicals in within our brains now i wanted to share this with you it looks a bit basic by the way and i've got a ton of the research behind it so just take this for what it is so if we're looking at hacking into the dopamine the oxytocin the serotonin and then the endorphin is everybody used to seeing those chemicals do they do they ring true for some of you apologies if we've got any neuroscientist on the call um, Couple of you, yeah, I can see a couple of couple of nods. Like you've seen it most probably somewhere. Um, Dr. Fearless, who is our neuroscientist that works with, um, with with me and my company, if she saw this, this is what she'd be now doing. So please don't share this publicly, this recording, because I know she's going to get The reason why I put this up is that we can hack our happiness. We can hack the dopamine. Yes, when it says eating food, no, it's not always chocolate and the Bad stuff you know you can you know you can have some good things in there i wanted to share this top one with you as one of the biggest hacks that we use with, with peak performance is completing a task for anybody that has read um, the work of jack canfield he talks about things that are messy or unfinished so one of the top tips that i can say to take away from what we're going through right now is you can't change what's currently going on for the next four weeks so choose a task that's messy in your life to finish it that might be a book anybody writing any books on the on the call show of hands anybody writing a book or an article <sighs> gave us all the thumbs up awesome 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 and um, vicky fiona jenny jacob if there's anything that you've got that's a messy task it's something that you've always wanted to do that you've always wanted to try kintsugi or you've always wanted to reach out to someone and have a conversation with i don't know whatever it is one of my top happiness chemical hacking tips is find a messy task that's in your life and unmessy it it's a very complicated term unmessy that's why i'm, I'm studying a phd so i can explain unmessiness <laughs> then serotonin so this one is for everybody in the group you know this stuff already and i'm not going to go through it that meditation for those of you that don't have any mental health challenges that are impacted by meditation and there are a few so it's not carte blanche everybody should meditate by the way there are a couple of conditions that um, under which meditation is um, useful or helpful and um, you know the running the cycling everything that you do and i've seen the awesome things that you do over there at um, to rent the greenwich training as well so the oxytocin, giving a compliment, can I challenge you? Number three challenge is giving a compliment. So I'm gonna put somebody on the spot. Oh, I know I'm one of those annoying speakers where I start putting people on the spot. I'm worse when I'm on stage, I get people on stage with me. So somebody in the group, who would like to give somebody else in the group a compliment? Owen's like, that's it, I'm done, I'm out of here. I'm off getting ready for yoga. I'm done. She's asking for compliments. You've hopefully will come back and I've not scared him off. Who would like to unmute and give another gorgeous person on this call a compliment? I will. Well, let me find who you are firstly because I can't see everybody. I'm one of the Katie's. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my compliment is for the other Katie, who I met very briefly the other day on Zoom. 
and I just wanted to say that I enjoyed her company and what she said with the group. Aw, thanks lovely, you're very welcome. It was nice to meet you too. <laughs> I, so, I, did, I, did, I don't know that Katie who just spoke, but she's got a lovely voice. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should hear us sing, Anne. <laughs> so, question for you all: What happened to Katie? Katie iPad and, and great name, by the way, Katie iPad and Katie <laughs> and Gray, What happened to their faces when that when they were giving and receiving the compliment? Um, please unmute yourself and, and talk to me. <laughs> they were both smiling. Yes. Yeah. And you know, that's why I know some of these things may seem lame. We see all these influences and gurus, but there's a ton of science. And if anybody ever wants the research behind this, then please, please let me know. There's a ton of research around it. But giving compliments doesn't have to be really lame. Um, and did, did Owen come back or did I scare him? Oh, Owen, you're back. Yes. So <laughs> Owen, I've got a compliment for you. So, Owen, I loved that when we talked about compliments you ran away from. I thought you did that running away so elegantly, so strongly, so powerfully. It was because something was boiling over. I'm making dinner. So, apologies for that. It wasn't deliberate. It wasn't on cue. <laughs> no, it wasn't. Owen, I see you getting up and down. I'm joking. It's um, absolutely, totally understand. And, look, and, you know, the reason why I, and thank you for that sharing the laugh and um, the reason why i wanted to you know to share that is because look you know katie and katie and katie just by doing something so little you know that humor that giving a compliment it doesn't have to be uh, and a challenge for you would be to give a compliment if anybody is a letter writer use this time to write a letter to someone write a card to someone and actually just give them a compliment you'd be amazed at how much of an impact that can make. And then the last one is the endorphins, which we know about like heavily, um, heavily for number one, which is laughter. And a huge believer in chocolates, just letting you know. So if anybody needs my PO box to send chocolates to, it's PO box chocolate lover at um, chocolate lover something or other. So and exercising is a huge one. Now I know we know all this, but you know, when we talk about the happiness chemicals, we We've got to master our own psychology to be able to get through what we're all going through right now. It's the ability to master our own psychology, hack the chemicals that are in our brain, that unfortunately are the things that are responsible. Remember that picture right at the start? That fear-based response, that happiness versus unhappiness, that serotonin level versus cortisol, that stress, that stress factor. So I wanted to leave you with that before we do a, a quick Q and A as well. You know, a couple of the a couple of the things that make sure by the messy task you complete it, give a compliment, keep doing what you're doing with the exercise, even on those days when you do not want to get up. And trust me, I know what that's like. It, the pain gets you, the tiredness gets you, whatever your whatever your thing is, but always go back to your why. And then obviously your mood stabilizes as well, which is getting out in nature. And um, you know, I'm a huge, huge believer in that. So a lot, we talk through an awful lot. I think one of the things that jumps out for me is that the community that you have is going to be so incredibly powerful. People underestimate how powerful these things are. We have an increasing rate of mental unwellness. So, you know, what you have is incredibly special at Greenwich. And, you know, I just want to say a huge thank you for um, having me, having a, a chat. I'm going to stop talking, huge amounts of talking. And I want to open it up for you to have a chat amongst yourselves, ask me questions, um, you know, and any feedback for me, I would love to hear. And I'm going to stop my screen share now as well. So I can actually see everybody's lovely face. Yeah, questions, comments, feedback, I can see everybody. Owen's still here, Owen's not run off again. Check, check your board, you need to check your panel and if things burn, I feel like I'm going to be responsible. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, what are you doing now? 
It's done. <laughs> I was thinking I was going to have to buy you pizza or something, have a pizza <laughs> in the house or get Uber Eats there. All I could think about is going to burn. I'm going to be twittering on He's going to have burned fish fingers. Or <laughs> oh, I wouldn't be disclosing anything like this in this forum. What I, you know, it's all obviously vegetables, you know. <laughs> so the thing is pizza in this forum. You look like a lentil and vegetable soup, man. So I uh, absolutely, I can see it. <laughs> One of the one of the things when you're talking about giving compliments, um, I, I I can't remember where I read it, um, but I thought it was a beautiful way of saying it. Is every time you think something positive about someone else and you don't say it, it's like having a present for someone wrapped and ready to give to them, and you never give it to them. And I think that's such a nice way of thinking about it because it's such a simple thing, and it's a really nice way to visualise it. I think. And how much does it cost? Yeah, exactly, a free gift. Free bonus gift. <laughs> Free bonus gift. And as we say in clarity, when we, we talk about, you know, I don't know if anybody else gets phone calls, sales phone calls, and all of those things, we all say, and you can get a free set of steak nams. Na, na, na. <laughs> and the reality is, you can get a compliment free. It costs zero. Hi, Katie. I can. It's Rory. Hey, Rory. Hi. This is Rory. Can you say hello? <laughs> you're being all shy oh. now. <laughs> There's going to be a test on this in the morning. I hope you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to give compliments. That's what we've been talking about. So you have to give somebody like your friend a compliment. Have to tell them how wonderful they are. <laughs> the other I like that. Sorry, I was going to say I really like that idea. I was going to ask a question about like how to cope when actually you, you're getting negativity from maybe from people in your life or whether that whether that's your often often in the workplace perhaps i think from what i'm hearing i'm gonna i'm wondering if actually you know what i'm just gonna be really nice to them back like sickeningly nice and compliment them and maybe that will make me feel better rather than i don't know trying to defend myself or going back at people i don't know yeah, and look, and it's sometimes our first response is that, let's go back. But the reality is, yeah, there's enough battles in life to fight. Like, we have we not got enough battles to fight? Like, I don't know about you, but I don't want to fight anybody else. Like, we've got enough, we've got enough internal battles. You know, our biggest, our biggest critique is what we tell ourselves. If I spoke to today or Jacob, in the way in which I speak to myself and my mind, Jacob would be, be like, wouldn't be happy. So I think, you know, Dave, your point around the fact that, you know, you, you need to sell this your brand. You know, I don't know if you've read um, Ernest Shackleton's, you know, if you've read the, the books, the Ernest Shackleton books, and it, it's finding a way around when all hope is lost. You find your way around it. And I think, yes, you can, Dave. You could go into battle. You know, you could go into fisticuffs. I don't mean actual fisticuffs. But, you know, you could go into that verbal. Sometimes I know people deserve it. But the reality is life's precious. Life is so, so precious. Save that for somebody that deserves it. And that's why, you know, one of the things that we have with Captain is we go into companies where it's very toxic as well. Very, very challenging and toxic. So we have to circumvent and go around that to find ways to create that happiness internally without it becoming that conflict. Because we can't put up against these people. These people are negative. They'll always be negative unless you can find a way. So, you know, we, we go back to that point about the event. Your response, Dave, will determine your outcome. And your response could be walking away, sailing the ship, or killing them with kindness. That's really interesting what you said, Belinda, about working with toxic cultures within companies. I wonder if you have any examples of how you've, you know, something you've encountered within a business that you've worked with. Because I think the thing is, in our personal lives, we have a bit more freedom, not always, but a bit more freedom to create our own community. And like GT is something that we choose to be part of because we see it as a positive community, something to really bolster us. But often work is one of those places where you can't necessarily choose, and family sometimes, but but work in particular, you can't always choose. You probably have to be there at least for a while. Um, 
and yes ultimately you might decide to move on but you, you often find yourself in those situations so are there any um yeah any words of wisdom around how to how to not only defend your mindset and your positivity from being sucked into that but also you know if you're steering a sh you know part of the business around that toxicity how do you how do you do that how do you influence in a positive way well, that is a great question by the way katie as well and i see a few people dropping off so for, for those of you that by the way that do have to drop off i just want to say a huge 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 thank you i can see a couple of messages coming through as well so you know feel free to to connect and, and drop a line and say hi if there's anything that you know we can share across with you we're more than happy to do that and you can research anything that we've done so if you do have to drop off before i answer katie's question just know that i'm incredibly incredibly honored and humbled to have been able to share some of this precious time with you as well um, so going back to, to Katie's question, that there's, you can go into battle or you can find an alternative around. Now, what I always say is I always talk about find out the reasons why. Often people behave in that way. It's often based around fear. So it could be, it could be fear or fear and threat. And that's the majority of our fear-based instincts. So try and find out why. And look, we work with companies where I've spoken to the board and the CEO, and they said, I don't care. I don't care what the reason is. I'm not interested. And, and I view it very, very differently. We all have baggage. But did anybody know coming onto the call, did I look like I had a disability? Did I look like I'd lost my mum and traumatised at a pretty young age? So you don't know what's going on in my life, and you know I don't know what's going on in Jenny's or Fiona's life. Um, I know that Owen pot could be boiling over, and I may have to buy him over eat. But I actually don't know what's going on in Andrew's life or Perry's life. Perry, you do look like you're drinking beer, though. Just letting you know. I know it's water, but it actually looked like beer when I first came on the calls. Like, oh, it's one of those calls. <laughs> Nobody told me. They invited the person who doesn't drink alcohol. No, I'm in sessions in the morning, so not on a Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, only joking. I have a, a very different sense of humour. Um, so look, going back to your point, Katie, is for me, I always go back to the reason why. I find out because I don't know what type of day you've had. I don't know what's going on in your life. You know, you've got a lot of people, um, you know, over one third of the population now have, at some point will have in their life, and by the way, that's an underestimation, it's more like two thirds to almost most people will have some form of mental health experience. And I know it's a very, very touchy subject, so I'm gonna say mental health experience and keep it broad. So when you're going to work with someone and they're toxic, we weren't born toxic. We were born happy as children. It's our environment, what happens with those chemicals also as well, that causes that. So look, Katie, if you've got the, the gumption and if you've got the ability, is finding out the reasons why. And it's easy to just dismiss it. And I know, Katie, the easy way for me to would be to say is just completely ignore it, don't get involved in it. But if it's a work relationship that you have to stay with, you can't just walk away from, is I would try to find out what else, you know, try to find out what motivates that person as well. Find their why. I sat with a client yesterday on a call and she's struggling to get some teams motivated. She wants to get some um, uh, professional development across the line and she's really hitting the brick wall from somebody who's toxic so i said disarm them with kindness you know get some kit kats that have got personalization on them take them out for a coffee and use use bright of course use chocolate and and sit down with them and find out genuinely the reason why and that might take a little while to build up to that as well but there is a reason, and I know already before she even told me, um, I know what the reason is with this particular person, and it's fear that she's potentially going to expose some of his um, areas for development. So find out, you know, what, what it is, and you know, by all means, message me as well. And I can get, I won't bore everybody, but message me. I can, you know, I'm more than happy to to give you some tips and hints as well. I would absolutely love to do it. anything you can do to create happiness. I'm happy to do it. 
Thank you. That's awesome. No problem. Thank you. Just, just to follow on from that, Belinda, I think a lot of people have, um, again, myself included, uh, out, coming outside of the work sphere and a lot of us are spending a bit more time or the, the relationships um, that we already have are via text message, via social media posts. Um, and it's this polarising um, of society that we've seen through various elections over the last few years and things, and that's just continued on in through this whole pandemic people have conflicting opinions and views on how best we handle it on how best we, you know we move forward um and i think that leads to people being more extreme when it's via these um you know social media platforms and stuff and i've there's a book i read a few years ago and i've recommended it to a few people probably in this group including people on the training team um called i'm pretty sure you'll know it belinda the, the subtle art rory's gone to bed now hasn't she the subtle art of not giving a fuck um it's such a good book and i feel like it's so appropriate right now and if you haven't read it look it up and have a read yes there's so many f-bombs in it the guy i think it is kind of why it works um but if you're struggling with that side of things which i think a fair few of us are myself included i struggle not to get involved and comment on things on social media um just the general lack of kindness and respect for each other that we're seeing out there and you kind of want to stick up for people or you want to say, what about this though? Um, then read that book because it can save you a lot of time because as much as people within work and family and, and your, your closest friends are worth spending the time on solving and healing those relationships, there's plenty of people that aren't deserving of your time and, and stress on these things. Yeah, 100%. And also what you know when you talk about social media, social media is a habit. It's an addiction. It's the same as sugar. It's the same as drugs. It's the same as alcohol. It's often not spoken about, but if anybody's in the mental wellness space here on the call, it's something that we talk about a huge amount. It's it, it, it's why people have decided no longer to live. It's why people are going through some of the um, you know the relationship challenges that they're going through as well. So where you can, if you want a really good book, read Tiny Habits by Dr. B. J. Fogg. So if you haven't already read um, Dr. Fogg's book, he's absolutely fantastic. I'm just going to pop it in the chat as well. So Tiny Habits is, so basically what that is, um, we've just done a Tiny Habit Challenge actually in Quantum Loops, which is the, um, which is the other company um, that I have with another four directors. Um, they're not on the call, but it's a great group, but we ran a, a Habits Challenge. So if you're looking for something like a habit change and social media being one of them, um, what Tiny Habits does, it does not tell you how to create all of these new habits on a superficial level. It actually gives you the mechanism and the science behind these. Uh, Dr. Fogg is incredibly well known and he's a, behavior, he's a behavioral change expert. So as we know with habits, we can't stop a habit. What we have to do is put a new habit on top of the habit that we've already got. So just for me to say now, okay, Owen, turn all of your notifications off your phone. You've got half an hour of screen time and that's it. And then car, I just want you to not use your phone between nine and five. It's a habit. It's like saying, don't breathe oxygen. Don't breathe oxygen between nine and five. So Dr. BJ's work and behavioral change specialist, we, what we do is we try to take your, um, whatever your habit is, that habit can be anything, and then we, we layer another habit on top of it. So we don't remove the habit, there's no such thing. You can't remove a habit, by the way. You just have to build another habit on top, which is therefore stronger to replace this habit, whatever this habit is, whether it's you know a cell phone usage, um, or whether it's drinking too much, whether it's exercising too much, um, I'll hold my hand up for that one. So, you know, BJ Fox, uh, BJ Fox's work is absolutely phenomenal. So, Tiny Habits book, I would highly, highly recommend. Can I, can I ask you one last question? Um, can I ask you what messy task you're aiming to finish during this partial lockdown? Oh my gosh, you're my ass. I've got to finish my book. I have to finish my book. So you can all, it's recording as well, isn't it? Dark, everything now. Ian, stop the, pause the, pause the, pause the thing.
thing. Um, no, keep it running. Uh, my messy task is my book, The Chief Happiness Officer. It has to be finished. Look, it's finished, and then I finish a chapter, and then I rewrite one, and then I go, oh, I don't mind, but everybody's going to hate that chapter. Um, oh, that's not going to be the right thing. Perfectionist kicks in, and the naysayers, and all of the other things that kick in, and self-doubt, and imposter syndrome. So my messy challenge is my book. I have to have it finished and you can hold me to it. <laughs> awesome. And guys, if anyone's looking for a messy challenge, next Tuesday's webinar, we've got the people from Sort My Space in to help you declutter your house, which is a really, it's a perfectly valid way of doing that as well if you're struggling for options. Thanks for the lead in there, Belinda. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, yeah, you need to put your spider on the ceiling away. Yes. <laughs> it can't, oh, can't Halloween go on a bit longer? <laughs> it's like Christmas. It can be 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days. It can always be Halloween if you want it to be. <laughs> Santa hat on the spider, Dave. God's sake, don't tell him that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Created a monster. <laughs> Our messy task is that we've, I was just talking about this when the call first started. Sal has agreed for us to be one of the advent windows in East Greenwich this they're, year. They're doing a trail for the, the school kids. So they get a map of houses and they go around and each day a different window gets lit up. And we are the 19th. So we've got a little bit of time, but yeah, we're going to go big. We're, we're Obviously, gonna, we're going to go big. The Polar oh. Express train in our window. Oh my gosh, I have got so many things flashing before my eyes of what you could be putting in that window right now. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, this is a picture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we will, we will send pictures. <laughs> Lots of pictures. So look, I know we've, we've oh, well, we've, we've, I know people dropped off as well, but I just want to say thank you to those of you that stayed on the call for a little bit longer as well. Yeah, and, you know, I hope that there was, I always say take one thing and leave the rest behind. So even if you took one thing from our conversation, and if you didn't, you have permission to contact me and let me know, and I will absolutely supply you with one other thing that you perhaps didn't take away from this conversation today as well. So, you know, huge, huge thank you, everybody, as well. It was, it was lovely to, to hear your stories as well. And, and Owen's pot didn't burn, which I'm really happy about as well. So I feel a little less anxious that I'm not actually ordering Uber Eats for Owen tonight. Thank you, Owen, for also having a laugh with me. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much belinda really appreciate you coming on and taking the time to, to chat to these guys um and, and to me